this is Kylie Mowbray Allen from Hello Media and Jenny Walk from Elephant in the Room Consulting. And you're tuning in to the Bite Size Business Live Video Podcast, the show that helps small business owners get clarity and insight to grow their dream business. So, hey, today we're talking about sales, and I'm so happy to be here with you, Jenny. How are you going? I'm amazing this week. Thanks, Kylie. It's so good. This is one of my favorite topics. I know we don't like talking about selling, but I actually love this topic. It's one of my favorites, but particularly for new business owners. Yes. So I'm just reading what we wrote here for our topic, how to get comfortable with selling. And that's such an important um, thing because you and I both, well, actually you may be differently because I know you used to work in sales. So maybe share a little bit about that to begin with, with how that was different for you then to how you approach it now. Um, really great question. Um, and I think the, the issue with sales is that people have that kind of image of the door-to-door salesman with the suit, you know, standing at your front door and knocking and kind of trying to get you to buy things and that manipulative Like a vacuum type. cleaner or Encyclopedia Britannica. Yeah, exactly. All that kind of when you go into a shop and you feel like you're being kind of sold to or kind of manipulated into buying something that you don't really want. So I think we've got this image of this old school salesperson. When I was a sales manager, I was a sales director um, for over about 10 years, working for Royal Melbourne Show, but also for um, leadership and development companies doing psychometric testing. And so the conversation we were having is as a salesperson, our job is actually to match our products and services with the needs of our clients. So it's actually not about selling them something that they don't need. It's actually about providing a solution that's going to meet a need. So when we think about selling, it's not about selling something and saying, hey, buy this widget, buy this widget, buy this widget, you need it, you need it, you need it. It's actually about saying, what's the problem that you're trying to solve and how can my product or service actually help you do that? And when we change that frame of reference to say that we're not actually selling something, but we're actually solving a problem and we happen to do that with an ex- a value exchange of they pay us and we give them something, It changes the dynamic and the way that you approach the whole sales process. Doesn't it just? I was at an event last night and um, this guy was asking me how things are going. And anyway, he's like, now that you're not doing the in-person and you're doing the face-to-face, do you find the selling part harder um, being online? And I thought, oh, interesting question. I'm wondering why he's thinking that. Anyway. He was a, an older man. And so I th- wondered if maybe, you know, this, this is quite foreign. And I said to him, and how it works for me is that I put out free stuff. So I do free workshops or free whatever it is so that people get to see me in action. Then if that feels like a good connection there that they like my vibe or something I'm saying really resonates with them and they think, oh, maybe I would like to work with her then they have the option to book that discovery call. So I feel like by the time that I'm on that discovery call, all I need to do is show them in one way how I might be able to help them in their business. And therefore it's done. They either decide, yes, I want to work with her or no, I don't. So I feel like the selling piece is being completely removed. And he stood there looking at me, just gobsmacked and went, what a completely amazing way to look at it and how much stress that removes from the selling call. And I was like, yeah, it actually just feels really organic, really nice. If you do want to, then, or you don't want to, hey, it'll work out if it's meant to, you know? And he's like, wow. And then he said, I wonder if I could approach that in my face-to-face stuff that I do and literally change my mindset. So I walk in and go, they already know who I am. They already will have an inkling if it feels right. All I've got to show them is, that my my thing will help them or whatever. And if not, fine. He said, I think it's going to change my life. And I was like, yes, let's hope. So Jenny, I'm totally with you. It's about taking the stress away and of the sell, 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 and literally just turn it into how am I going to help you? But the, the reality is, is that selling is a key part of business. You cannot have a business unless you sell it. So Absolutely. sales doesn't have to be, you, you could do a value exchange, you could barter, you could do time in lieu. There's a whole different ways that the, the exchange is, is often related only to money. But the sale is actually more than just money. 
but a sale is essentially how a business gets revenue, right? Unless you're a not-for-profit and you're getting funding or you're getting donations or philanthropy, sales as a requirement because it's actually the, you know, the prov provision of a service or, or goods in exchange for money or revenue to, in order to run your business, make a profit, take a wage, pay staff, buy product, all those things. But we get caught up in this idea of selling rather than saying, what is the purpose of our business? And it's come about from that idea of that widgets, you know, when you walk, you, with, you with, and I guess for me, when I was working for the Royal Melbourne Show, we had 385 stalls that I needed to sell and, or fill in order to create a Royal Melbourne Show that people wanted to come to. And there was enough commercial operators that people were like, oh, I'm interested. That made it interesting. But the call, I didn't actually go out and sell any of those. We basically said, we have 385 spaces. If you have a product or a service that you think Victorians want to see and you want to promote to, come along. What my job was, was about curating that. We didn't want to have 85, you know, henna tattoos or massages. So we limited the numbers of those. So when people came through, they had a balance and they could have what they wanted in products and services. So that sales process, I was facilitating a sales process for our end clients being Victorians and people coming to spend time and enjoy the Royal Melbourne show. It wasn't actually selling the site. It was selling the experience at the other end. And by changing that conversation for us, we actually had you know, record sales and record um, outputs because people started to see the value of being part of the show experience, right? And so this idea of saying, I need to get revenue to run a company because that's the way business works. And if that, I have to sell my product. But if you change the mindset like you've done and like I've done to say, it's not about selling, it's about providing a service or a product that the client needs that's going to solve a problem for them, fill a, you know, make a solution, you know, create a new way of seeing the world, whatever it is, then the sales piece just becomes the transaction at the end and not the process. But we spend all this time going, how do I get my sales process to work? And that's the wrong, that's the wrong question, I think, that people are asking. Beautifully put that the sales piece is just the transaction at the end. I absolutely love that. And that example you gave of your experience with, experience with the Melbourne show is so perfect because you're right. Because for me, if I'm a product-based business or doing henna tattoos or whatever, then I need to get in front of a gazillion people and you're offering me that opportunity. So the fact that I need to pay for that, and yes, what is that amount going to be, et cetera, et cetera, is it possible for me at the time, you know, all those considerations. But at the end of the day, if my business needs to be in front of those people, then I have to find a way to make that work. Yeah. So I think that's just gold. So you did right. You're not selling it, are you? You're offering something that might be a great fit or might not. But we think about that. I mean, if you, if you, if you wanted to get really into the nitty gritty, every time you post on Facebook, whether it's a call to action or just an information post, you're selling, you're promoting your business, you're telling people what you do, you're creating trust, you're building value, and you're engaging with your community. So that's actually the sales process. So if we wanted to get real, the reality is everybody who posts on Facebook or any social media every single day is selling the process of selling. What happens is, is, is they look at their conversion, how successful their sales are, is how many people are clicking, writing, you know, so you could actually argue that if your purpose or your intention of the sale was to get a comment or a like or a, you know, a call to action, that's the end of the sales process because the process is, I want you to, I'm giving you something and I want you to do something in exchange, that's sales. But what we're saying is that's the first step in our process and after that, like you, you like what I do, you click on my link, you make a comment. The next thing you do is you go to the next part of the process. The next sale is the discovery call. When the discovery call is done and that sale is complete, then they might choose to give you money or not. So there's actually several points of sales throughout a sales process if we get real about it. But we don't like to think that because then all of a sudden we're selling all the time. But that's the reality of being in business. Whether you're, it does, and whether that's a not-for-profit, a charity, or a for-profit business, or a social enterprise, we need continuing value exchanges in order to survive. Beautiful and, continuing value value exchanges. I love it. Yeah, Jenny. What about my hard and fast rule of the eighty twenty? Where, in terms of your social posts and your, you know, even your newsletters, etc. So I 
it's not like he, anyone ever told me this was the hard and fast rule. I made it up myself, but I've lived by it for a very long time, which is that 80% of the time you're edutaining in your posts and 20% of the time is when you're selling. Because what I found was people would set up their business page and they'd think, oh, got to get sales. So boof, boof, boof. And they just pump what they do endlessly, buy my thing, grab my course. Da, 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 da. It's like, why? what's the reason for me to continue following you when all you're doing is selling at me? And so when you turn that around and that 80% of the time is the either educating people in the post or entertaining people in the post, it makes all the difference because as you said, you're still selling, right? Because you're still telling people about what you do, but you're reframing it and rephrasing it. So you're giving value instead. So it might be three ways to write an amazing email subject line so that people actually open your emails. Or it could be this amazing dog bandana that's going to make your dog look so Christmassy, you know? And so either I'm going to look at that and go, yes, or it might be, how to zhush up your dog for Christmas or something like that. And I'm like, yes, I need to know about that. But they weren't actually selling at me at that point. They were just giving me ideas, for example. So I feel so strongly about that. But then I think you said it so well is that all of that is selling, but we've just got to reframe it so that we're not just going hard out, pushing at people rather than giving them a nice experience. And I think it's it really depends on the product or the industry you're in, right? Um, I remember many years ago, I met the marketing manager and he used to be the marketing manager of one of the furniture, you know, the kind of mid to low cost furniture producers who used to do those ads. It's like, buy now, buy now, 60%, da, 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 da. constant kind of pushing sales, the loud ads that you tend to mute on when you're watching on television. And he, they, but the company decided that they actually wanted to shift and they wanted to become a bit more high end and a bit more like kind of some of those other providers that kind of have very, you know, lifestyle oriented. This is kind of the, the person that you want to be if you buy our product. And when they changed their marketing strategy to that kind of higher end kind of experiential space, they actually, their sales actually went down because what they recognized is their clients wow. purchase from them because it's fast, cheap, and easy for them to purchase from them. And when they shifted their marketing to this kind of hiring clientele, their clients who had been loyal with them for years went, that's no longer us. Right. So I think it's about recognizing what do your clients want and what is the product you're selling. If you're selling high-end coaching or coaching packages that are big 12-month coaching packages like you and I do, our clients are not looking for to being bombarded and sold to. They're feeling they lack confidence. They're probably sitting in some imposter syndrome. They're not quite sure what they should do. And they want to feel like you're a safe pair of hands. So for us, that edutaining, that information, that value exchange of here's some information to help you build confidence. So when you're ready and you're able to kind of make the leap, I'll be waiting for you. And they know that. So there's that kind of safe pair of hands process. Every time they open an email, every time they put a comment on, we have a value exchange. We're going closer along that sales process, closer to every one of those individual sales until we get to the point of them doing the, the, you know, the financial exchange versus somebody who's like, my job is to sell high volume widgets. High volume widgets at low cost is not about experience. It's about quick sales. And mm -hmm. that's okay. So you just need to understand where your market is and how you want to do it. And if you know that and say, my clients want X, give them X. If your clients want Y, give them Y. Don't try and change your clients. Match the way that you sell to what your client needs. Beautifully put. And was that example that you gave, was that rugs? Did I remember? Uh, no, it actually wasn't. It was one of those kind. It was a furniture, um, kind of a big box furniture store. Right. So in my mind, I turned that into rugs. There you go. <laughs> But maybe it's because I remember those Cypress, per Cypress Persian carpets and you know, the really full on boom, boom, boom. But it reminded me of, a, there's a guy in our main street of Bangalore that's a rug shop and very, very glorious high-end rugs, antique, just stunning, stunning, stunning rugs brought in from, I don't know, Turkey or somewhere glorious and a bazillion dollars. So when I was chatting with him some many, many years ago, and I said, you're in it because he's like, oh, I, I've got nothing to post. I can't post anything because, you know, what do you do? Just here's another picture of a rug. Here's another picture of a rug. 
And I said, actually, the reason I would want to follow you is because A, I bought my rug or B, I'm looking to buy a rug. But either way, you need to keep me following you. So what you want to do is talk to me about things like how to look after your rug make sure you don't vacuum it too much or don't vacuum over the same spot or use the setting on the vacuum or whatever it is. How do you mop up a red wine spill? You know, all those kinds of little tips that you can be sharing to keep me following along. Then when a friend of mine says, I'm looking to buy a rug, can you think of anywhere? And I'm like, yes, you're top of my mind because I've been getting so much value and enjoyment from your posts. So that's it. If we turn your example into rugs, and then those are cheaper rugs. It's like, you know, they're sending lots out the door all the time. And those people might be buying more rugs. Might be, I need a runner. I need one for the bedroom. Or oh, actually, I've changed my color scheme. So yep. I'm going to get another one now because they're cheap enough to do that. Whereas this is a completely different type of business with the high-end rug. So giving that extra value and um, tips and tricks and things is so different. So I think that you're 100% right. So I guess all I'm saying there is that Yes, because those two rug shops have completely different markets. So the yeah. way that you would go about sharing your knowledge and doing that sale and, and doing that sales process um, is very, very different. A hundred percent. And I think that the key thing here is recognizing the difference between selling and your sales process. Your sales process is how you build engagement, how you get in, you know, people to inter be interested in your product or services, how you actually move them along their buying journey from, I don't think I need this to I might need this to, oh my gosh, I can't live without this and you're the one that I need. That sales process of actually changing their mindset needs to match their journey and their position. So if they're at the very early part of their journey and they're still just exploring, that edutainment and that information is critical because we're actually creating the need for them. We're actually saying to them, you have a problem. You may not have realized you had a problem, but there's that kind of niggling. It's like someone who's got a sore hip, right? I've got a sore hip. It's not a problem. But then I tell them, hey, do you feel like you're comfortable walking everywhere? Oh, no, I actually, now that you've mentioned it, it's a bit uncomfortable. And so I'm actually raising awareness or we're raising awareness to people's challenges or problems that they have that they may not actually have conscious awareness of. So that's what the sales process does. It raises awareness of a problem and then says, by the way, I can help you with that. And then by the way, I can actually align my solution to your problem. And so this will then solve your problem. So let's talk about what your future state will look like if you actually solve that problem. That's when you break that down, it seems like, oh, actually, it's very clinical, but that's actually the, the way that we process as humans when we're going on that buying journey. And so if you match your sales process to that buying journey, you're going to get alignment and you're going to get better sales. But sales mm -hmm. is just that outcome. Sales is just the value exchange at the end or throughout the process that moves people along their buying journey. And I think when we start to get comfortable with that idea and say, well, I don't want to sell. I'm like, well, cool. Go get a job. Yes. The reality is if you don't want to sell, then you shouldn't be in business. Very harsh thing to say. But the reality is, is every time I talk about my business, every time I talk about the clients I work with, the work that I do, how I operate, that is actually me promoting and selling and bringing people along the sales process, whether I do it overt, I'm, I'm overtly or just inadvertently. That's what you do as a business owner. Mm, absolutely Jenny so getting comfortable with the word sales or getting comfortable with selling maybe people need to do what what we do which is just remove the word selling out of it and go you know how am I helping people etc or turn it into I need to think about a sales process rather than think about the selling finite thing at the end yeah. And I think that's, I think that's what it's about. It's about reframing in your mind what selling is. Selling is just the value exchange. Selling is standing at the register, putting that, you know, at Woolworths, there's a value exchange. That's the sell at the end. But you want to imagine how do we, when you're wandering around the supermarket, looking for what you want, how does your product or service stand out more than anyone else? And how do you attract people, keep people engaged through that process? So you're the product or service they've picked up when they're at the checkout. So it's the sale, the selling piece, is, I would say just reframe it as essentially, it's an essential need of your business. It creates revenue for your business, but it's an exchange of value, whatever the value looks like, money, time, barter, whatever it is. But the process that gets people there is way more important 
than the sale at the end. Jenny beautifully said, and I'd like to bring up an example that we could workshop. That is a client that I think is having a bit of a struggle at the moment, not with sales or anything like that, but they're, you know, incredibly successful. They have a little sticky point at the moment, though, where they're wanting to change the wholesale side of their business so that they're bringing on more agents for the different states to get their products into shops. Now, a number of agents that they've approached have ummed and ahed for a little while and then said no. We can't do, we can't work with your business because your packaging is not on trend enough. And so they're quite, I think, probably quite personally hurt because they love their branding and their design and all of that, you know? So what I said to them the other day was, what those agents are forgetting is actually who your audience is. Your audience is an older demographic. It doesn't need to be um, something that's appealing to the 20 or 30 year olds that are going to take photos of their bathrooms with the products for Instagram, et cetera. So, you know, let's look at that. And she said, well, yes, you did right, but that doesn't matter because what we need is to be into giftware shops on the shelves. And they're saying the shop owners will not have them in there because they don't look so whatever. Fancy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what she was saying, and it really broke my heart a little bit, she said, I just feel like we, I don't want to play their game because they were suggesting she then puts everything in boxes. So that, of course, is going to add $5 per product onto each product, which is crazy. Plus, also, what happens? They take it out and they throw it away. So it's really going against everything that they're all about to try and combat that issue. So I said, I think we need to do some posts about this and do some polls. Because it straight away brought that little song to mind, Am I Not Pretty Enough? And I thought that's really heartbreaking, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, she kept saying it's what's inside the product that's so important. Our product is phenomenal. You know, many, many products that they have, all made locally, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you think about that? And the Am I Not Pretty Enough to be sold? Um, sorry, we just got to this. People around me behind me so apologies if you can't hear me um so the, the issue there is around an again alignment of client to product so the, if you're looking to use a sales agent whether it's again for selling uh, for getting your product into store or whether it's actually from a service provider and wanting to sell your coaching program overseas it's actually ensuring you find somebody who actually understands your ethos of your product and is matching your product to the clients at the end in the stores so there are many stores who only choose products based on the aesthetics of the stores. And then there are those stores that choose the products based on the product itself and what it does. And so if you think of something like Biome, for example, I'm just going to use that as a really great example. They're, you know, the national company, they're all about eco-friendly products. And so if you go into that store, everything is stripped back. There is little packaging. It's about the product and what the eco-friendly aspect of that product is, rather than necessarily the look and feel of the product. In fact, some of the products you look and go, wow. The colors are a bit bland and this is a bit bland, but they're looking at what the product does and how it aligns with the value of the person who's purchasing it. So it sounds like this, but in this particular instance, the salesperson is looking at the high end because they're looking at higher costs, higher sales value, rather than looking at aligning the product with the actual client. And so this is where we, and because the, for them, they're saying, I can sell it at a higher price to a higher end store, which means less sales for me, less work for me versus saying, how do we find the right niche and the right market alignment that's going to actually then do the value exchange and not care about those things? So I think to your point exactly, it's aligned that that sales rep is not aligned to the product or the business. And that's important because whoever's representing your company, whether it's through a sales process or whether it's through a sales rep or online has to represent your company. And if you've got someone who doesn't do that, then it's not a good fit and you're not going to get good sales anyway. Dead right. It's about totally aligning yourself with the right people, whether that's the agent, whether that's attracting the right customers, et cetera, for you. So yeah, absolutely. It's definitely an interesting piece, isn't it? And that's going to be a little airwig in my brain all day, that song. <laughs> Am I not pretty enough? <laughs> but yeah. I agree. And so what I'd said to her was, you know, at the end of the day, that's not your market, clearly, that's if they're caring about what the packet looks like. And it may be in some respects, and they might say, look, we've got a client who wants high-end packaging, and I'm going to have the same product with a different packaging, and in doing so, I'm going to increase my revenue and increase my, my cost.
but that's a choice that you need to make. And it's not just about a packaging price. If you're changing the packaging, then it changes your whole cost structure. And you have to then look and say, well, if this is my base cost, what is my sales price? And then who is my market then? So it's actually just adding packaging doesn't actually, you have to then rethink your whole pricing structure and business model, not just add packaging. So it's a bigger decision. So that says also to me that the sales rep doesn't understand that whole cost structure of running a business. They're only looking at the end product. Um, and a really great example at the moment, and I love the recyclable containers for like with my um, detergent and stuff, I buy large containers and I put it in a glass jar, which I refill rather than buying the small bottles. An example, Morning Fresh has just created a replaceable, like a ceramic jar that you can actually pump action for your detergent in your sink. So I, I used to have a little one, like a glass one, but this is actually quite a good size one and it's designed. So they're going to be actually selling refillable packages into that. So they've changed the packaging to suit someone like me that likes to have this permanent thing sitting on the sink. It looks nice. It's not hidden under, underneath. It's more convenient. So they've changed their packaging, but they changed their price point for that particular package. Now, someone like me likes to buy that. Someone else are like, no, nah, I just want the standard white bottle with the green lid and don't care what it looks like. So they're two different markets and you have to price it and position it according to who that market is. Really interesting, Jenny, because I was, as soon as you started mentioning that, I thought, oh, wait till you hear about these. Clearly you don't know about these yet. But um, one of the members in Positive Passionate Businesswoman has a business called Good Sheet. And it's not uh, sheets for linen, it's sheets for washing. And so they come in completely compostable packaging. You literally just tear one and a half, pop it in and it's done. So you have no original plastic bottle even that it came from. Yeah, They're amazing. Those. I've been using them for about a year now. But what I also love is that they get delivered to my house every three months. So another thing I just don't have to think about. It's so, so awesome. And um, so therefore, interesting thing is that I never actually looked at the price and did a price comparison. Others would, I'm sure. But for me, I love the fact that it was compostable, completely zero waste. Yeah, and I yeah. thought, yes, I'm sold regardless of the price. So yeah. that's an interesting one, isn't it? And it is because that's the type of market. So that's when we look at pricing in the way that we sell, we're, we're, we're needing to align our product to our market. Some people won't buy that. They won't want that. Others are really, that's their, that's their driver like yourself. That's your decision making. Your buyer's journey is based around that. So this is about aligning what your product is to the person you're actually wanting to use it or engage it at the other end and unless you do that well there's always going to be disconnect yes absolutely well jenny as usual <laughs> usual usual so great chatting with you and uh, enjoy the rest of your retreat there at uh, mount tambourine it's a very very glorious spot Indeed. so next week we'll be chatting about Next week, I think we need to actually stop. We're coming into Christmas. So I think we did this last in June and we also did this last year. I think we need to talk about six weeks out of Christmas for those who are selling products or looking to close out the year strongly. How can you create a really compelling offer at this time of year when we've got all the different cyber sales and everything going on? How are you going to actually stand out and have a, a sale or a promotion six weeks out for Christmas that takes advantage of this end of year, but allows you to close out your year really strongly? Beautiful. I love it. How you can stand out in the noisiest of, my, of times in the marketplace. Very much. Beautiful. So great to chat with you, Jenny. Um, how can everybody get in touch with you? So to get, uh, sorry, to get in touch with us, try, um, go to Elephant in the Room AU, just put into Google Elephant in the Room AU, you'll find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and our website, um, as well as Instagram, which is where we love hanging out. And how about you, Kylie? How do we get hold of you? hellomedia.team and that's all the different places except facebook is hellomedia.dream team so i look forward to chatting with you next week and um thank you so much it's always as always fabulous great chat i love talking about sales and it's about reframing so remember everyone today have a think about your conversation with yourself i want to challenge you this week think about your sales process and think about your selling piece as just that final value exchange and see if that changes the way that you actually engage with, with that aligning um, your sales process and your promotion of your products. Brilliant. Love it. Look Have forward a great to day. next time. Have a great time and a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Carly.